Good afternoon. My name is Jacqueline Rodriguez. I'm the, the uh, Public Affairs Officer for the San Bernardino County District Attorney's Office. We're here today to hold this press conference to discuss the charges on 11 defendants in connection to an industrial-sized subterranean illegal marijuana grow found in the city of Newberry Springs. Also a processing warehouse and other properties related to the and related to the selling, manufacturing, and distribution of illegal cannabis. I'd like to give you a brief timeline of the events leading up to the filing of our defendants identified in our formal complaint. In August 20, 2020, a search warrant was served on the illegal cannabis grow located in the city of Newberry Springs. The property owner at the time was Sheng Lin. Deputies observed a single-story residence on the property. They located eight greenhouses and over 2,000 live cannabis plants and over 100 pounds of processed marijuana. Detained at the property were additional defendants Zheng Wei Hua and Ren Xuan Hua. On November 19, 2020, Sheng Lin sold the Newberry Springs property to Chao Wan Lu. On March 3rd, 2022, just over a year and a half from the time that Sheng Lin sold the property, deputies from San Bernardino County Sheriff's Marijuana Enforcement Team again served a search warrant on the same property in Newberry Springs. They observed the same single-story residence, several sheds on the property, and one single Connex box. Upon searching that Connex box, um, eight additional suspects were actually at that location, I'm sorry, and they attempted to flee, but they were detained at the property. And upon searching the Connex box, deputies discovered that the floor opened and they were able to descend into an underground bunker. The length of the bunker was 230 feet in length and 60 feet in width. And it was constructed with over 30 connex boxes, approximately 15 feet below ground. The square footage alone of the underground grow approximated at 14,000 square feet. And in, in total, there were 6,000 marijuana plants located. A cultivation of that size could produce over 3,000 pounds of processed marijuana. And with black market prices, at the way they are now, that amount of marijuana is valued anywhere between $4.6 million and $9 million. In addition to that, it would be remiss if I didn't note that a grow that size is estimated to take one gallon of water per plant per day, indicating that the minimum amount of water usage would be at least 6,000 gallons of water daily. So we have well, one more thing I wanted to add is that upon further investigation, processed marijuana was found in the residence of Sheng Li, as well as a commercial lease agreement, also in his name, for a commercial building in which law enforcement found numerous items used for cultivation of marijuana and over 200 pounds of marijuana product. So that leads us to our filing. The San Bernardino County District Attorney's Office has formally filed the following charges. We have one felony count against Zheng Hui Hua and Ren Zuan Hua on counts one and two, which is Health and Safety Code Section 11358D3, cultivating more than six marijuana plants with concurrent violation of environmental law, and one misdemeanor count of Health and Safety Code Section 11359B, possession of marijuana for sale. Counts three and four are both felony counts, and these are against Huang Ji Lu and Chao Yang Li, A Chin Lu, Zheng Wei Hua, Ren Zhen Hua, Wu Lin, Li Jia Lin, Bin Li, Huan Lin, and Meng Feng Hua, and Chen Shan Lin for counts three and four, both felony counts of cultivating more than six marijuana plants with concurrent violation of environmental law, and we are further alleging illegal, illegal discharge of waste 
and intentionally and with gross negligence causing substantial harm to public lands and other public resources. All defendants above were charged in count five, which is misdemeanor possession of marijuana for sale. And our final count, count six, which is only against the land owners, Kiao Young Lui and Xuan Li. As landowners, they've been charged with felony PC 182, conspiracy to commit a crime. Thank you for bearing with me. Present today, we have San Bernardino County District Attorney Jason Anderson, San Bernardino County Sheriff Shannon Dykus, San Bernardino County Sh Sheriff's Department Marijuana Enforcement Team, San Bernardino County Code Enforcement Chief Ignacio Nunez, and Deputy District Attorneys from our Consumer and Environmental Protections Unit. At this time, San Bernardino County Sheriff Shannon Dykus will make a statement followed by District Attorney Jason Anderson. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end. And ladies and gentlemen, Sam Dykus. Thank you, Jackie. As all of you know, a year ago we launched Operation Hammer Strike, and it was due to the concerns of the citizens in this county as a result of them being accosted and seeing the environmental damages that were going in their local communities, Lucerne Valley, our high desert areas, and Newberry Springs, as mentioned earlier. The bunker case, as we refer to it, like Jackie said, was almost 14,000 square feet with 20 individual grow rooms. The product that was recovered on the day that we hit the bunker was $3.4 million. And I think it's of note that everybody should understand the people that are involved in this business illegally, it is a risk versus reward situation with the reward far outweighing the risk. That's one grow cycle. Multiply it by four grow cycles that could have occurred in this bunker and you're up around $12 million. The money in illegal marijuana is not certainly a victimless crime. There are a number of things that happen to these. I've had deputies pass by these areas in Newberry Springs and had rounds go through their front window. And not because they knew it was the cops, simply because they knew that someone was getting too close to their investment. As Jackie also mentioned, two of the suspects in this case were also rearrested in the bunker case. There is so much money in this and so little penalties, you see offenders reoffending. Right now with Operation Hammer Strike, we're on track to have recovered and taken off of the streets, and I'm talking about the market value of the marijuana, $750 million. <clears throat> and by the time we complete Operation Hammer Strike, I think that number is going to be closer to $1 billion of product. There is a number of crimes, both environmental and personal crimes, and when you talk to the citizens out in our county areas that are accosted as they go around these things, this is not a victimless crime. Many would think that that's the case. We have several opportunities in this county to grow marijuana illegally, and this is simply, again, a risk versus reward opportunity. I'm so glad to be here with my partner in this, Deputy DA, I'm sorry, Jason Anderson. And Jason, with his help, will bring these suspects to justice on a case that's significant in terms of supplying illegal marijuana throughout the state of California. Jason. Thanks, Sheriff. I appreciate that very much. And um, I want to thank uh, uh, a couple members of our team. There's a lot of members of our team, but uh, two of them are here. Our Assistant District Attorney Julie Peterson has headed this up, and Supervising Deputy District Attorney Carrie Epstein uh, is really the fuel behind our fire in terms of tracking all this down, so I want to thank both of you for that. Uh, as the Sheriff said, uh, this, I think, takes a little bit of perspective taking. Uh, so oftentimes the narrative in California is that marijuana is legal. And in many instances it is, and in those instances we don't have any problem with it. We realize that the government has decided to regulate it in a different way, and that's okay with us. The problem is, is that when you have these massive industrial illegal grows, is what you're doing is you're putting unfair competition on an industry that's trying to be regulated, uh, and the state is trying to get some good out of it and actually keep people safer from an environmental aspect of this. Uh, the way I would put it to lay people, and, and the reason I say this, is that we have, uh, the, the individuals who live in the rural areas of our county, uh, as the sheriff said for a year, year and a half, have said this is a major problem for our quality of life up here. And it's very difficult to get people to understand the conditions under which they're living when they see the truck traffic and, and the firearm use that the sheriff talked about and feel like nobody cares about um, what's going on up there. Uh, we have taken these different measures and different steps because oftentimes the law doesn't allow us to have the teeth that we once did to be able to prosecute uh, even the sales of marijuana. As the sheriff talked about, 
The amounts of marijuana in this case, if they were all sold and you could prove it, it would only be a misdemeanor. You know, think about that. What, what disincentive is there uh, to do that if you're talking about $3.4 million worth of product that you could sell and it could still be a misdemeanor? So I want people to think about it this way, is, you know, obviously Amazon Prime does a business. They have warehouses at the corners of the 15, the 10 freeway, the 60 freeway, out here by our airport, and they sell legitimate uh, products, and they come to your house sometimes the same day you ordered them. What we got going on here is we have a bootleg Amazon selling uh, illegal or counterfeit products out of a warehouse that's buried underground. Who can compete against that? Jeff Bezos couldn't compete against that. Right? And just because products are legal to get at your house in a day doesn't mean every product that you get at your house every day is legal. And so what we're talking about here is massive scale, illegal, counterfeit, bootleg uh, conduct that's having a tremendous effect on the environment uh, for our residents in the, in the rural counties. And so that's why we want to bring attention to this because that's really what we're dealing with in a marijuana setting versus an idea where most lay people would understand, hey, what's the big deal? What would be a big deal uh, if you wanted to order an iPad or a Mac computer and it was uh, counterfeit and it came from a warehouse that you had no recourse uh, to go back on. As the sheriff said, you're talking about Connex boxes that were 76 yards long. That's three quarters of the length of a football field in terms of what's going on here. As he already pointed out, we have two people that were on the property two separate times. One of the approaches that we've taken and we talked to the Board of Supervisors about this is that why that's so important in these instances is that what we're really targeting is the landowners. Because once we can say that these properties are known to contain a nuisance, we're gonna take the property. We're not gonna allow somebody back on that property to do what was done here in at least two different instances in which we can separate, and we're gonna take those properties. And if those folks can't remediate uh, the properties uh, through uh, appropriate sentence that we may uh, get in this particular case, uh, then, then we will work with the county to try to take uh, that property and then sell that property to make up for the remediation because the taxpayers that are law, law abiding shouldn't be on the hook for the illegal conduct that's been engaged in here. You know the other components of it if you think about it again for people to say oh marijuana is no big deal you know why is the sheriff why is the DA involved in this and why is it important to announce uh, charges about uh, 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 11 individuals who are engaged allegedly engaged in illegal activity. There was 5,500 gallons of fuel on the property to fuel generators that were used to air out the space uh, and to cure the plants. If you think about six bucks a gallon at $5,500 a gallon, that's $33,000 of fuel that was sitting in reserve to power generators that we allege was, um, was harvesting an illegal product. There's a lot of people that can't afford to put enough gas in their car to get to work every day, and these operations are taking fuel, 33,000 gallons of it in this particular instance. And that goes beyond even talking about how it was stored, whether it was environmentally safe, what impacts it were, uh, but obviously that's something encompassed in the charges that we've alleged in that particular case. And as the sheriff already talked about, Jackie talked about the water issue. So when you combine the fuel issue, the cost of the fuel, uh, what it does to the consumer, uh, and the water issues, um, what you're talking about is the danger to the environment. We, we had committed to the residents of rural high desert and to the uh, Board of Supervisors that we would approach this in a different way because charging people with misdemeanors simply weren't going to work. It wasn't going to be a disincentive and it wasn't going to be able to help the folks in this county who enjoy living in those rural areas. And that's why we're approaching it with the environmental aspect because we think everybody in this state can get around that. They can rally around that and understand uh, what the importance is. And I hope that people understand that the component of what we're tracking down and why we want to take the land and why we want to partner with code enforcement the sheriff's department is because the importance of looking at these other disciplines to actually have some teeth so that as the sheriff said the cost benefit analysis goes out the window individuals who want to engage in this activity here know that their land's either going to be taken or we're going to get creative to prosecute and you're not going to do it here anymore uh, and so uh, i just appreciate the opportunity to be able to get this type of information out uh, the efforts by the Sheriff's Department and, and by our team, by Julie and Carrie, I know sometimes on the outside of the public it seems like we're not doing a whole lot. In some instances, the law just doesn't allow us to do a whole lot. But in this instance, uh, we feel that it, it's been the appropriate case to proceed the way we can. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't have charged these individuals if we didn't think that we could prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. I want to make it very clear that every one of the persons charged here is innocent until proven guilty. Uh, but procedurally, this case is in a lot of different area and a lot of different space because of the work that the Sheriff's Department has done and that Carrie and Julie have done uh, to see this through to talk about the measures that we can get. Ultimately, to hold individuals in this case responsible, but to make sure that in this county people know that the efforts between code enforcement, the Sheriff's Department, and the DA's office 
are something that are going to come together to where people aren't just going to shrug their shoulders in the rural parts of our county and go, oh, marijuana is no big deal. Because if you live out there and you see the water trucks and all the, and all the, the dirt trucks <coughs> and you're faced with being mad dog when you drive by your, your property by people who are holding guns, that's a problem in that neighborhood and that's one that we're sensitive to and we hope uh, that this is the beginning of, of remediating that uh, and getting life back the way it should be up there. So uh, with that, uh, Jack, you can turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you guys very much. At this time, if there's any questions for any of the attendees, media can go ahead and ask. Uh, yeah, back on, on to the seizing of the property. Can you just explain how that process is going to play out? Is that new <clears throat> as well? And then um, also, do you plan on doing that going forward with most of these, these growers? In, in the areas under the penal code, we're able if we're able to show uh, the land uh, and define it as a nuisance, then we have the ability to try to put it back into a receivership. And with the county's assistance with some of the ways in which they partnered with us to tackle this throughout the county, uh, we're going to be able to do that sometimes with county council and oftentimes with code enforcement. It starts with the remediation of the property once we identify the fact that there's illegal activity on it. The other aspect is why we've been giving notice to landowners when the sheriff's office goes in there uh, and takes over a row is exactly what you see in this case is that the landowner knows that in one instance your property is being used for an illegal um, reason and if it's being used at a subsequent time for an illegal reason and you're still the property owner or have connection with the property owner then that obviously is better in terms of imputing knowledge that they know that it's only <coughs> used for illegal activity it becomes a nuisance and then we can put it in the process of receivership which means so, sell it and then just sell it as the county exactly exactly so but but so that gets that 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 landowner off of it but we also hope that it shows that it's not just another piece of land that somebody can set up an operation on and make money on again, that we're actually going that step further. And that takes a little bit of work because obviously there's civil side involved in that. Uh, we have actually, uh, we have a couple uh, contract civil attorneys on this team uh, that Julie and Carrie uh, have overseen to help us with that because that's a different process. We have to be very careful about how we do that so we do it the right way. So it's not new in terms of it existing in the penal code, but it's new in terms of the way we're utilizing it to be creative in this area where we think that has a little bit more of a punch as opposed to a misdemeanor sales charge. How confident are you with this property that you'll be able to execute this? Well, I think that based upon the investigation and the idea in terms of the way the property changed hands in this particular instance, I think we're in good standing in terms of a notice component for the landowner. It's just a matter of us being able to do the lift of getting it to the point um, where, you know, if, if we're able to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, getting some convictions out will go a long way in assisting the county and code enforcement with first the step of remediation. Because you can imagine the cost of remediation for a bunker like this is going to be significant. The taxpayer shouldn't pay that. That land should be sold by the county to get those costs back. So we're confident in this area. That's why I talk about it. So, and I'll be honest, it's not going to happen in every case. Sometimes you're just not going to be able to have those components of the notice requirement and the civil and criminal aspects that you need to make sure you're doing it the right way. In this instance, we think we, that we will. Were all the defendants in this case uh, taken into custody? Is anyone outstanding in this investigation? Uh, there's five that were taken into custody, and so that leaves six outstanding. And if you want to know the five... I, have, um, I just put the oh. file up on the screen right here. These Perfect. are the ones that we have arrested as of Friday. And outstanding, we still have these oh. defendants. And uh, with it, these uh, defendants, uh, they believed uh, this believed to be like uh, funded by uh, just like a is it internal like a uh, organization as part of uh, some larger scheme you guys are aware of. No, I, I just think it's a, it's a it's a conglomerate of individuals that had connection with these properties over a period of time, and the evidence indicates in both instances that these are the folks with the most connection, and these are the ones that, based on the investigation, we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. What led to that search warrant? And then also, you guys were talking about them being armed. Had residents seen that? Did a lot of these people have guns? Or? Yeah, I may, I may turn the question in terms of search warrants and all that kind of stuff back over to the sheriff with all of that. So I don't know how much of that they can talk about. So, I'm going to get into the actual search warrant itself and then how we ended up at the location. But I will talk about this particular location. We did not seize any firearms. On average, at the grow locations that we are investigating now, we're seeing about 40% of the time that we do recover firearms from them. So you didn't seize any firearms, but you, you guys had talked about some people having those on, I mean, prior they had been seen with it's firearms? It's an overview of what's going on out there in the Newberry Springs area. 
I've had deputies patrolling out there, and that's what I was referencing, is we recently had one of them have a round fired through their window simply for getting too close to another grill, not specifically this one. In, uh, in the past, uh, I know you've, uh, your department has referenced uh, with these investigations, Operation Hammer Strike, uh, there's sometimes like a quote unquote Mr. Big out there is uh, somebody who's like the, the, the big man behind the, the, the plan. Is, is this Mr. Big believed to be in custody or are they believed to be outstanding? In terms of this, in terms of this case, this, this specific investigation. <clears throat> all we know is that all of these suspects are involved. Who, what the hierarchy is, we'll break that down throughout okay. the process. But um, as far as it being connected to other grows, I mean, a number of these things are independent. Some of them are working in conjunction with each other. Some of them have separate processing facilities. Um, we find a number of things, but each one's taken individually on its face. Okay. So Shunglin had sold his property, but still was kind of part of the operation even after the fact. That's our understanding, yes. Okay. How, how big is the property? What size of the property? No, the, five, the property five acres. Five acres. Does anybody live on the property, or just street use for a girl? I, were there outbuildings that were people living in? I think there's just simply the bunker. And the I bunker. think it's from their, their first experience, there were people living on it that you could see above ground uh -huh. what they were doing. So obviously they learned from the first time and now went underground with it. You said that uh, one of the officers or somebody shot through a window or something. So is that another operation that you guys are investigating? That, that's another operation that we previously investigated, yes. There's a question in the back. Yes. Uh, what is the maximum? exposure for all of these people and uh, it says that Shung Lin had been previously arrested. Do you know how long he served in prison before going back to this property and doing all of that? I don't believe he was previously arrested. I believe there was just a previous investigation on this property and him and for exposure time it would depend on the... Uh, Sorry, I cannot hear sure. you. <laughs> I don't believe Mr. Chung Lin had been arrested before. The allegation is that uh, he was involved in the prior grow in 2020 uh -huh. because it was his property, but he wasn't arrested at that time. Regarding exposure, it would depend on uh, the individual suspect because there's multiple charges, so it wouldn't... I wouldn't be able to say specifically, generally, this is what everyone would receive. It would depend on the individual and what they're charged with. Okay, from lower end, blah, 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 to higher end, do you have any ballpark for that? It would be potentially maximum exposure could be four years, four months, uh, but again, that would be aggravated and there's a lot of sentencing factors now in California that uh, uh, create mitigated presumptions. So again, that would just be what the potential aggravated would be, not what the uh, potential sentence would be. There would be a lot of factors that would have to be considered by the court in making that determination. Okay, uh, so one more time, Shung Lin was not arrested, but he was detained along with Zhang Gui Hua and Wen Ren He the first time around? No, just Mr. Lin was the property owner the first okay. time around. The other two individuals were at the grow site. Mm -hmm. Obviously, through additional investigation by the Sheriff's Department, uh, it was developed, obviously, based on the information we had from the first grow and the second grow, which led to the charges against him in this case involving both grows. So were any of them arrested the first time around, went to prison, came back to redo this whole thing? Uh, they were not arrested. Uh, they were contacted uh, and then released, and then the investigation continued. Do you give up the age of suspects as well as uh, their nationalities? I can get you the age afterwards of each subject. And nationality? I don't have that information. We don't have that information. Okay. Thank you. That concludes our press conference. Uh, on those packets is my information. If you guys have any follow-up questions, please feel free to email me or call me. And that concludes our press conference for today. Thank you so much for your time.